So again, in this session, we're going to start with a meditation. And of course, today the main topic is the shamatha practice. So we'll do a shamatha meditation. And shamatha practice, remember, the goal of shamatha practice is to develop our attention skills, to be able to focus single-pointedly on an object with relaxation, stable, and clear. <laughs> Now, in the meditation texts on shamatha, it mentions the fact that we can focus on any one of many different types of objects. And the general recommendation is to use the object that works best for you. And the one object that is probably emphasized most in most Buddhist traditions is the breath. And that's what we used yesterday. And so probably for many of us, you, the breath is probably going to be the best object to use in this practice. And we did a couple of variations of the breath practice yesterday, focusing on the rhythm of the breath, which is particularly good for relaxation. We are focusing on the abdomen in one session. That's particularly good for improving stability. And then we are focusing on the nostrils. That's particularly good for improving clarity. But here, of course, in Mahamudra practice, the focus is on our mind. So therefore, also in shamatha practice, in Mahamudra system of practice, we use the mind as the object for shamatha practice. So that's what we're going to do now. But just a few um, tips and explanation about the practice before we do it. So when we say that the mind is the object, what are we focusing on? Is we're focusing on our mind plus whatever mental events arise in our mind. So that, of course, includes things like thoughts, emotions, memories, mental images, and so on. So we're observing the mind and then anything that is appearing in the mind. But we're not focusing on sense objects. So in this practice, this shamatha practice, we're not interested in listening to sounds, focusing on sensations in the body, looking at visual things. So sense objects we're not interested in. Of course, in this practice, sounds will arise, sensations in the body will arise, but we're not paying any attention to them. We're not trying to block them out, let them be there, but we're not interested in them. The only thing we're interested in is mental events, thoughts, emotions, memories, mental images. That's what we're focusing on. And of course, the key here is that we are simply observing these thoughts and so on arise and pass, meaning not identifying with them and following them and not trying to get rid of them. So in this practice, we're not trying to make the mind still. And in this practice, thoughts are not problems. In the breath practice, thoughts were problems. If it came up, you have to let it go and go back to the breath. Here, thoughts are part of the object. We are focusing on them, so we're not, they're not problems. What the problem, of course, is, is grasping onto the thought and following it. That's the problem. So we are to simply be like an impartial observer or witness, simply observing whatever's arising in our mind without following it, without trying to get rid of it. Just watching it as it arises, passes. Now, of course, we're not usually in the habit of doing this. Our strong habit that we've developed for many, many years is usually, if something comes up, latch on and off we go. And if it's something unpleasant, then the other habit we have is we try and stuff it back down, we try and suppress it. So they're the two things we do now, either following or suppressing. So the middle way in this practice is just observe. Whatever's arising, just watch it as it arises, passes, without following, without trying to get rid of it. In this, and of course, many of you will probably find this much more challenging than the breath practice, focusing on the breath, for two reasons. One is, the mind is more subtle. The, the sensations of breath, physical, tangible, easier to focus on. Mind is not some physical object, more subtle. And the second reason is we don't have a habit of observing our mind. Our strong habit is either following our thoughts or trying to get rid of them. So, but there are huge advantages with this practice, particularly in our modern society. Because 
as I mentioned yesterday, we tend to be the slaves of our own mind. We're often tormented by our own thoughts, emotions and memories. This practice will help us to become the masters of our own mind instead of being the slaves of our own mind. Because if we can step back and simply watch these, these <coughs> thoughts and so forth arise and pass, we're not getting caught up in them, they can't overwhelm us, and the habit of them coming up will get weaker and weaker and weaker because we're not feeding them. Which means over time our mind will naturally become more quiet and still. In this practice also, very much recommended to have the eyes open either slightly or just naturally open. A number of reasons for that. One, of course, is in general, with the eyes open, it helps improve clarity. With eyes closed, much easier to drift into dull. So that's one reason. Another reason, of course, is um, with the eyes open, and with eyes open, we're not actually looking at anything. We're just resting our, our gaze in the space in front of us because we're focusing on the mind. So we're not actually physically looking at anything. Of course, we're not trying to, to deliberately unfocus, that's straining the eyes. So just resting the, the gaze in the space in front of us and focusing on the mind. Um, so with the eyes open though, it really helps to lock us more into the present moment. With eyes closed, it's much easier to drift into the past and the future. Eyes open, it's much easier to stay in the present. Another reason to have the eyes open, of course, is that, and this is to do with the Vipassana practice which comes after, is that with the eyes closed, there's a, really a strong sense of me in here, world out there. There's a strong sense of subject-object duality. There's a me and the world is separate from me. But with eyes open, that strong sense of duality is, starts to break down. There's not such a strong sense of me in here, world out there, with the eyes open. Which means that if we get used to meditating with eyes open in this practice, we are starting to break down this grasping onto duality, which of course is what we're trying to realize in the Vipassana practice. So therefore, this will be help us when we, first, when we then go into the Vipassana practice. And the other reason having the eyes open is uh, recommended or beneficial is also in daily life, we want to be able to observe our thoughts, emotions, memories without getting caught up in them and so forth. And generally in daily life, we're wandering around with our eyes open. Which means if we only have developed this ability to watch our thoughts with eyes closed in meditation, it's much more difficult to transition to daily life, to do it in daily life, because we're not used to watching our thoughts with eyes open. Whereas if we meditate observing our thoughts and emotions with eyes open, then when it comes to daily life, it's going to be much easier to do that because we've got the habit of doing that with the eyes open in meditation. So these are the reasons for having the eyes open. So again, eyes open, uh, we're not looking at anything, but we're not trying to deliberately unfocus and we're not trying to keep the eyes open. So we need to blink as often as we want, keep the eyes relaxed, just resting your gaze in that space in front of you. Any questions, anything not clear about what the practice is before we go into the practice? Okay, so let's do that practice and get a little taste of this practice of observing the mind as the object of shamatha. As always, we begin by preparing the body. So 
again keeping the back nice and straight. And at the same time allow the entire body to become completely relaxed. Using the out breath to relax and release any tightness or tension in any part of the body. Breathing to flow naturally and effortlessly. And then preparing the mind, setting it into a state of ease and relaxation. Not dwelling in the past, not anticipating the future. Simply allowing the mind to come to rest in the present moment. And simply become aware of the rhythm of your breath. Now allowing the eyes to be at least partially open, resting your gaze in the space in front of you, keeping the eyes soft and relaxed, blink as often as you need, and now bring your attention to your own mind, and observe your own mind, and whatever mental events are arising in the mind. Thoughts, emotions, memories, mental images. Simply observe these mental events as they arise and pass. 
without following thoughts, without trying to get rid of them. Simply be like an impartial observer or witness, observing them as they arise and pass, without grasping to them, without becoming distracted. If you're new to this practice and you're not sure where to focus, then every now and again deliberately generate a thought. Any thought will do. And simply watch that thought as it arises in your mind and then watch it as it disappears back into the mind. And then keep your attention right where it was and see what arises next in that space. If you find that you've got caught up in a thought and got carried away, then again the first thing to do is simply relax. Then release grasping onto that thought 
and very gently return to observing the mind. So again, relax, release, and return. Each time you get caught up and get carried away, simply keep coming back to the mind again and again, patiently and happily.
just to talk a little bit more about that practice before we go back to the text. Um, and again, to do that, I'd like to read a little bit from a book called Attention Revolution from Alan Wallace. It's a uh, book on the shamatha practice. And he talks about this practice as well. And on page 101, he says, when you first begin the practice of settling the mind in its natural state, so that's what he calls the shamatha practice of observing the mind, he calls it settling the mind in its natural state, you may have difficulty identifying the intangible domain of the mind. Or even if you do settle your awareness there, after some time your attention beco may become vague, disoriented or spaced out. If you have difficulty identifying the domain of the mind, or sustaining your attention there, consciously bring up a thought such as, what is the mind? And attend to it. Don't think about this question or try to answer it. Just observe the thought itself, watching it emerge in the field of consciousness and then dissolve back into that space. Once it's gone, keep your focus right where the thought was and see what comes up next. If you slip back, back into a kind of lax, mindless vacuity, deliberately generate the thought again and observe it with bare attention. <laughs> when you become familiar with this practice, you will no longer need to generate such a thought to crystallize your awareness and locate your attention. That will happen by itself as thoughts arise and pass of their own accord. The practice of attending to the space of the mind and whatever events arise there is like taking a naturalist's field trip into the wilderness of your mind. When you first embark on this inward journey, you may perceive very little. But as you grow more accustomed to the practice, you will begin to identify an increasing quantity and range of mental phenomena. Some of them are discreet, like thoughts and images while others are nebulous, like emotions and moods. This practice provides you with experiential access to a domain that cannot be observed with any of the instruments of modern science or technology. The most they can do is detect the neural and behavioral correlates of the phenomena you are observing directly. You have become a naturalist of the mind and a whole new world is opening up to you that for most people remains largely unconscious. In this practice, the locus of awareness gradually descends from the superficial level of coarse mental activity that is immediately accessible through introspection down into the inner recesses of the mind that are normally below the threshold of consciousness. You discover in this training that the border between conscious and unconscious mental events shifts in relation to the degrees of relaxation, stability, and clarity of attention. Especially when you engage in this practice for many hours each day, for days, weeks, or months at a time, you dredge the depths of your own psyche. In doing so, you remember long forgotten experiences, both pleasant and unpleasant, and a wide range of desires and emotions. What happens here is a kind of luminously clear discerning free association of thoughts, mental images, memories, desires, fantasies and emotions. You are plumbing the depths of your own mind, undistracted by external diversions. Once hidden phenomena are unmasked through the lack of suppression of whatever comes up. This is potentially an extraordinarily deep kind of therapy, and the more intensively you practice it, the more important it is to proceed under the guidance of an experienced, compassionate teacher. During your meditation sessions, internalize the wisdom of this contemplative tradition and make sure you implement the core instructions of this practice, which are, whatever arises in the mind, do not be carried away by it and do not grasp onto or identify with it. Just let it be. Watch thoughts, feelings, or other mental events arise. With discerning intelligence, be aware of their nature and let them slip back into the space of awareness without any judgment or intervention on your part. This is the key to letting the knots of the psyche unravel themselves as the extraordinary healing capacity of the mind reveals itself. This is the path to deep sanity. <laughs>